Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today I have Craig Fisher with me uh, to discuss Ephesians chapter 3. Craig? Yes, I am Chris's father. This is what he's going to look like in 30 years. So I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, but what you see is, is what you get. I'd like to talk about Ephesians chapter 3, the most important chapter in the whole Bible. And it's the most important for us people that are living today who exist because it talks about the dispensation of God. And by dispensation is meant the, the dispensing of benefits and what's required from us. So God requires something from us and in return, he gives something to us. Now, of course, God requires our faith. And, and even though it's required, uh, faith is, is not a debt, like Romans 4, 4, but to him who works, the wages are not considered as a gift, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes, his faith is counted as righteousness. So even though it's required, faith is required by us. It's not something that earns us salvation. Salvation is given to those who believe, not as a debt, but as a gift. And so what is required from us in this dispensation, what does God want us to do in order that we may inherit eternal life? If that's what Ephesians 3 is about. That, that's what makes it important. That's why everyone should pay attention to Ephesians chapter 3. The first uh, verse we start out and he talks about being a prisoner. He says, For this reason I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And so this is likely written after he is imprisoned uh, in Jerusalem and being sent to Caesar to account for his being arrested, uh, his appeal to Caesar. And so, literally speaking, if we turn to Acts 21, 22, he is arrested because there are zealous believers uh, who want him dead, as per James. And there's, there's a rabble that rises up when he goes to the temple, probably a mix of believing Jews and just uh, the normal traditional Jews, and all are out for blood because he had been teaching Jews not to circumcise, to forsake the laws of Moses. And so he counts this as, as uh, towards the Gentiles. He says, I am writing to you guys, you Gentiles. I am in chains. I'm a prisoner because of you, because of the things I've been preaching. Things that benefit you um, has aroused this much error, uh, hatred of me. There were, there were people who took vows to kill him before they would eat or drink. And it's clear why he's a prisoner. He says in Ephesians 6 that he's a prisoner because of the mystery of the gospel. What is this mystery? Of course, mystery means secret. So it was a secret before, and we'll, we'll get into that. But this mystery is revealed in Ephesians uh, chapter 3. But it's not the mystery that you think it is. Because in Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about the gospel that was preached that uh, came through the forefathers, that they were expecting a Christ to come. This Christ would be descended of David. It's not the mystery that Jesus Christ died for your sins and was resurrected. This mystery is a, a mystery about the relationship of God's people uh, that that are in a state of salvation and their relationship uh, to each other and to God. And that's what we're going to get into in Ephesians chapter 3. 3.2, 3, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Stewardship, of course, is oikonomia, which you look at the two word, Greek words that make it up is house law. And what, it, what it's talking about is where we get our word economy. It's talking about a relationship between uh, <clears throat> a steward, someone who works for somebody, and, and his employer. 
<clears throat> and we get that in nations. We get the what happens is the the, the dispensation of the benefits and, and the responsibilities of society, and we call that economy. So that, that's what they're talking about here. They're talking about what is our relationship to God, what does God require from us, and what does God promise that we'll receive when we fill those requirements. So it looks to me like this is saying that God's grace has stewards, and one of those stewards is, in fact, Paul. He has the stewardship of God's grace. And he has a ministry to the Gentiles. That's, that's his stewardship. That's, that's to whom he's bringing that specific part of God's grace. In the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ died for your sins, and he was raised, and he was seen. That gospel was given to who? It was given to everyone, mostly to the disciples, to Peter, James, John. But what was given to Paul? He says that this mystery, this stewardship was given to him specifically as a person. And how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. So it's a very uh, personal, it's related to Paul, it was given to Paul, it was made known to Paul, and uh, this is what he wants his fellow Christians, those people that he discipled, he wants to know how he received the mystery. Yeah, <clears throat> so this mystery language draws on ancient mystery cult language, and the mystery cults were secretive orders who had a secret knowledge for initiatives that was kept secret on pains of death. There's ancient accounts of there are two Athenian <clears throat> youths who were put to death for accidentally violating the mysteries. There were tourists in, I think it was Eleusis, and they stumbled upon the mysteries and uh, they were put to death because of that. And so these are secretive orders, cults, secretive initiation rites with secretive teachings. And so a lot of times when he's writing to Gentile cities, he draws on themes that are found in those cities, like ideas uh, that, that are there. For example, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he talks about uh, high places that, uh, uh, in heavenly places, kind of alluding to maybe the temples that were on the tops of the mountains in that area. And so he, he does this often where he takes... A pagan concept and he expropriates it for his own use and so mystery language is there's some sort of secret initiation knowledge only made available to high-ranking initiates in some sort of cult setting and that seems to be how he's using this concept in this passage if you notice it says it was made known to me by revelation Paul says in Galatians and in, in it's very forceful about it. He said, I, I didn't go to the apostles. I didn't go to Peter and those who were before me and receive some instruction to receive some training. He, he didn't go to a theological school. He didn't go to those who were apostles before Paul and go to them for instruction. But what was made known uh, to Paul in this mystery was made known to him by a revelation direct from Jesus Christ. He says, and when you read this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. And this is very specific, it's very personal. It's my insight, my perception into the mystery of Christ, not the perception or the insight of the apostles, not the insight of those people who were apostles and prophets before him, but it's an insight that he has personally into the mystery or what they call the secret of Christ. It says, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this is new knowledge. This isn't something that has always been known. It's not like in Romans when Paul says that Jesus Christ, you know, a descendant of David according to the flesh, that, that everybody knew that this event was happening, that the Christ was coming. And 
Maybe they didn't know the specifics of everything that was going to happen when Jesus Christ died and was resurrected. But this isn't what he's talking about right here. He's talking about the mystery that in other generations was not be made known. And prior to Paul's uh, existence in that generation, uh, th there was a lot that was made known about Jesus, Jesus Christ. There was the revelation to Zacharias. There was a revelation to Mary and Joseph. There was a lot <clears throat> about the gospel as we know it, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that was made known in other generations. But to Paul, a new mystery has been revealed that in other generations was not revealed, but now is revealed to those people who are prophets and apostles in the Spirit. <clears throat> and what is that mystery? What is the mystery that was not made known in other generations? So you look at Ephesians 3.6, it's introduced by an infinitive, and, we say, and that infinitive modifies what the mystery is, and that's what 3.6 says, even though if you if you look at the English translation, it says this mystery is that the Gentiles. The the word this mystery is is referring to um, Ephesians three four, where it talks about the mystery, but to be specific or to be that the Gentiles, and our fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of His promise. What's very, very important and is left out in a lot of translations, except go to the New American Standard 96 translation. That's the best translation. And that is that we are fellow heir, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. If you look at the English up there, it almost says the same thing. But I like the <clears throat> New American Standard 96 translation the best because it brings out the force of that preposition that's on three words fellow heirs that's soon fellow soon heirs which is the preposition preposition soon which means um, to be to be together fellow fellow heirs fellow members of the body soon susuma that soon is preposition shows up on that <coughs> on the word body and fellow partakers that soon it's soon, kleronima, soon soma, soon metoka. That preposition occurs three times and is emphasized here. Fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And what it means is that when you go to Exodus 19, and God tells and promises Israel that they are going to be a priest to all the nations of the world, that their nation together will be priest. That in, in Zacharias, you'll have people coming and grabbing the hem of a Jew and say, take us to God because we hear that God is with you. They're acting as a priest, a mediator between God and the people. And that promise is reiterated in Peter. He says that the people are... The Christians at that time are going to be priests. <clears throat> that they're going to lead the rest of the world uh, to God. Then, uh, you're, so he calls, talks about a priesthood and a holy calling. But instead of that happening, this is a new revelation. We are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of his promise. We no longer have to go to a priest. We no longer need the intermediary. And all of us are on equal footings. There's not some who are going to act as priests to lead us to God. But we can go to Jesus Christ and to God directly because we're in a new dispensation where we're fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of his promise. Right. So the mystery isn't that the Gentiles have a part in the plan because that's always been part of the biblical record. The mystery is now their equals in this plan. They were never meant to be equals in any part of the Old Testament plan. They're always in a subservient role. And then if they wanted to be equals, they had to go through certain rituals to get incorporated into Israel to become part part of Israel body politic. But 
uh, the Gentiles as a class of people were still going to be in that subservient role, bringing riches to the new Jerusalem, bringing gifts and, and acting as, as like vassal states to uh, kingly priestly Israel. And so this, this uh, message of equality is the reason that Paul is persecuted. Paul in Acts, he starts claiming that uh, his gospel is now to the Gentiles, and this seems to enrage the Jews, and then they imprison him. And when he's called to account in front of James, he says, uh, you're telling these Jews to forsake the laws of Moses. Uh, these people are zealous for the law. Um, they take issue with what you're preaching here. And uh, absolutely, he was preaching those things. If we continue in, in Ephesians 3, it says, Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his promise. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to announce to, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And this, this word... Uh, in the Ephesians 3 8, uh, unsearchable. It, it's it's a, a compound word, but it, the the root of the word means to track. It, it's like a hunter is going into the wilderness and he looks, and across the trail he sees the footprints, the tracks of his prey, and, and with he identifies. Uh, what the prey is or the direction the prey is going and then he follows those footprints so that he can hunt down that prey and take it back but what it but this unsearchable uh, is translated different ways but what it means is it cannot be traced there's no tracks in the Old Testament there's no tracks in the Gospels there's no tracks to come up to this conclusion that the Gentiles are now on equal footing with the Jews. The Jews have always been a special people, but Paul's going to say that the Jews have been set aside. They've been taken out and a new branch has been grafted in. That's the Gentiles. And now the Jews and Gentiles are on equal footing, and this is not traceable in the Old Testament, that's what he's talking about. Not that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is untraceable in the Old Testament, but this new equal footing of Jews and Gentiles toward God was not traceable. It says, And bring the light for everyone. What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? And to Paul is given to bring to light. Why? Because it was hidden beforehand. Why? Because... It was a mystery. <laughs> it wasn't there. It was a secret. It was a mystery. Paul is bringing it to light. So Paul's talking about something else other than the gospel. He's talking about this new mystery, this new dispensation where everyone comes to God through faith and is then a fellow heir and fellow member of the body and fellow partakers. In other generations, in other dispensations, there were things that people had to do. You had to follow the law. You had to um, perform certain acts and certain rituals. You had to go to the feasts in Jerusalem three times a year. There were lots of requirements to do in other dispensations. But in this dispensation, the only thing that's required is faith. And that faith, this, this dispensation that is saved through faith... This is what Paul is bringing to light, which was hidden from other generations. Ephesians 3.10, So that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there's a few references there to that this has been an ongoing and endearing plan uh, in the mind of God, but is now being revealed and has not previously. And, and this boldness and this access that we have in him, before the access was limited because you had to go through 
the priests. You had to go through the priestly nation of the Jews in order to get to God. And there, there was an ordering. There was people who were leading you on to Christ. But now there is no mediator uh, between God and us except Jesus Christ. Therefore, we don't need the mediators of the priests. We don't need the holy nation that God had promised before him. That nation's been set aside, and we now have a new dispensation, a new dispensation where we receive access to God uh, through faith alone. All right. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Again, a reference to this is, these are the Gentiles he is addressing. He's saying, this is your glory. This is what which benefits you. And this is why I'm suffering. The benefits that we receive through God because we access that through faith, not by works. He details out that the riches of the glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit that Christ will dwell in your hearts. Jesus Christ gave Paul a new dispensation that he's describing here in Ephesians 3. And it's because of that dispensation, you and I who believe are now members of the body of Christ. All right, so uh, that kind of uh, summarizes the mystery part of Ephesians 3. The mystery is this idea that there's some sort of secret hidden wisdom. And Paul identifies this with the concept that Jewish, the Jewish Jews and, and the Gentiles are now equal. Jewish-Gentile equality. And this is, not some, this is something that's really new. And if you read through Acts and you pay close attention to uh, how how these things play out, Paul typically approaches the Jews first, but the Jews always reject this message. And then he turns to the Gentiles next. And the Gentiles were a little bit more receptive to this message for obvious reasons, because uh, then they wouldn't have to circumcise anymore or do other parts of the law, but probably primarily the circumcision part. And so he had turned to the God-fearers and convert them. So Paul's idea was that there's a new dispensation, a new working of things, it's something not before revealed, and this allows for Jewish-Gentile equality. If you read something like Romans, and uh, he talks about the cutting off of Israel, the grafting in of the Gentiles, he later states that uh, the, the Jewish concept is not yet done, there's future plans for that. He's not very specific in that, but for the, the purposes of a salvation or ent entry into the kingdom, uh, we're all on equal footing. Well, Craig, any other final <laughs> closing thoughts? I just want to say it's it's not the newness. It's not because you're going to the Gentiles, because in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, you always have Gentiles that they can obtain access to God if they go through certain rituals, if they become circumcised, if they follow the law. Even Cornelius was was given a commendation because of his works and he talked about works mixed with salvation so the idea that the gentiles were were now receiving the access to salvation that's not what they're trying to talk about they're talking about putting away <clears throat> the priesthood of believers the priesthood of the jews as access to god and now we are equal partners and come to God through faith alone. All right, uh, that's going to end our podcast there. If you have any questions or comments, put that down below or start a thread on the God is Open Facebook group. Thank you for listening.